doing? Hey, I'm doing great. I didn't know it was Ball Guy Day. It was being ranked. I mean, how do you lose? This is the Dynasty Vipers Vipercast. Hello and welcome to the Dynasty Vipers Vipercast. But before we head into this week's show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It's the only time I'm going to say it this week on the show because this week class is in session. As Tara Major myself, we are joined by Professor John Lobb here for some Debbie 101. We are breaking it all down for you and giving you some early rankings ahead of those Debbie drafts. And who better to do it than the professor himself, a master's in history, I mean, we're talking about a guy who's got professor experience as an educator, and he's won a little bit of money doing this thing. I think I seen something when money was actually worth something back in the early 90s. It was like it was John 10Ks when people were calling you back in the day. So we are pleased to have John coming on here to talk about college football, Debbie football, campus to Canton, anything you could possibly want. We're going to talk about it here on this week's show. But John, before we really get into the questions here, the first question everyone always asks when they are looking at possibly a new league and whatnot, first off, what is Debbie and why do people need to get in on the action? So the first thing I think people need to know, Debbie is short for de- developmental. So one, I, I think the word Debbie isn't a great description of the game or the hobby that we're trying to play. Kind of the goal of Debbie is if you're like me or anyone on this podcast right now, we love football probably at all levels. Before we went on, Matt and I were talking about CFL football. I used to watch it with my grandfather back in the 80s. He was from Detroit, Michigan. They used to have it on the um, channel, whatever it was, seven or eight back in the day. So if you love college football and you want to take your fantasy experience kind of to a different level, The Debbie space says that you have X amount of players on your roster, but they're kind of like a taxi squad. They're like a reserve squad, kind of like a major league baseball with double A or triple A players. So you actually have a Debbie draft. Now in a startup, it's a, it's a Debbie draft, or you could have a supplemental every year once the league gets going. So what you're trying to do at about this time of the year, there's a lot of Debbie drafts going on, a lot of people trying to, you could add it to your keeper league. You could add it to your current dynasty league. You're going, like right now, what I'm doing every day is watching two or three players who I believe are NFL draft picks right now. I'm a teacher. I have the summer off. I can pop in for an hour, two hours, and watch tape of Caleb Williams at USC. Now, that's just, we all should know if you're watching this. I'm sure you know who Caleb Williams is. So the goal is, Debbie, is try to find players who are going to pop not only at the college level, but more importantly as an NFL stars. So as an example of a Debbie player last year, you can lose or gain value. If you and I were sitting down last year, Zach Evans, who ended up going to the Rams in the sixth round, was probably a top six Debbie player. Like people were totally in on Zach Evans. As another example, Israel Abandakanda was not on any Debbie roster anywhere. Now, whatever the value is of him, whatever you think of him, he ended up getting drafted before Zach Evans. So it's really a fun game to try to find players. But one of the things that's interesting is the wide value changes. You know, last year at this time, Jordan Addison was my number one wide receiver prospect. And I think he was number third wide receiver by the Vikings, if my memory serves me well. Quinton Johnson, I wasn't as high on him. You know, I think he was drafted before Jordan Addison. But you see these value swings, which makes Debbie very interesting. Mm, So so not being... A Debbie person myself. Yeah. The feeling you described just kind of sounds like the feeling that I get doing best ball drafts before the NFL draft. No, Tara, that's a great, <laughs> great analogy. I mean, I, you know, it's funny. I've already seen players I have a lot of shares of in best ball that I can't get anymore because yeah. all of a sudden their value has gone way up. I mean, I probably am way over invested in Kendra Miller, but I slowly see his value creep up as. There's not a lot of positive news about um, 
Alvin Kamara. And there's another guy. No one had Kendra Miller on their radar. We knew once Zach Evans left TCU that Kendra Miller was going to be the starter, but he was like a CFF sleeper. You could get him in round 12 of your college fantasy football draft. I think I ended up with Kendra Miller, my number four or five running back prospect. I love him. We do have the injury concerns, but I think he should be healthy by training camp. So it's great to watch, but then when you do find Nugget, I'll get my one of my favorite Debbie players that I've had for years was Brees Hall. And people thought I was crazy. People didn't like him in college fantasy football. If we went two summers ago and I told you Brees Hall was going to be the number one running back in the draft, I bet you nine out of ten people would have disagreed with me. I loved him at Iowa State. Now, the injury just breaks my heart. It's just a personal thing. Because I think Brees, I mean, he was on pace for a stupendous rookie season. But that's, so those are the great news. Like I loved having Brees Hall for that long of a time. So, so what's the difference between college and Devi when you're drafting these players? Like what's the, like, what are you looking for? So absolutely. Well, I have, if you go to fan tracks, I have a little formula right now. So one thing you have to be aware of, and I've done a lot of research, like the 200 pound threshold means a lot. Now, I love Devin A. Chain in Miami, so there's always going to be outliers to those statistics. Tara and I were just in a draft on um, Independence Day, and I took Devin A. Chain in round like 9 or 10. I forget. I really like him in Miami. Now, he's under 200 pounds. I did not have Devin A. Chain on a Debbie roster because the odds of being a successful NFL player under 200 pounds, the numbers are not very good, folks. And then it's the G5 and the group of five or the P5, Power 5, SEC, Pac-12, Big 10, ACC, Big 12. Those players, I I hate to say it because I love G5 football, the lower level. And I just mean like the teams don't have the financial resources and the athletes. But the reality is that the Power 5 conferences put more players into the NFL level. So when I'm doing a Debbie roster, I'm looking for power five players, and let's just talk running backs, power five players who are over 200 pounds. Now, I'd like to have them an early breakout. Soft By sophomore year, they produced, uh, let's say, a 900-yard season rushing, and, or they have produced an 800-yard receiving season. That doesn't always happen like Kendra Miller was behind um, Zach Evans on the bench. That's going to happen. Now, in college fantasy football last year, I had Devin A. Chain on seven of my nine teams because I love Devin A. Chain in that system at Texas A&M. And Texas A&M, I thought they were they fell apart last year. Their quarterback was, I'm going to just put it kindly, was awful. But I thought they were going to be a better football team. But Devin A. Chain was a great college fantasy asset. I think he ended up with over 1,300 yards rushing, 14 touchdowns, 35 receptions, something great. So from college, he was unbelievable. Debbie, I was lower on him. I Obviously, I, you know, I didn't hit it right because I thought the weight would matter in the speed Miami it works. Does that make sense, Major? Yeah, it does. So, so you're like drafting in Debbie. You can grab it, guys, at freshman year. You can. So I actually had B. John Robinson on one team for three years. Now, that's a it's worked out. Well, so he's number eight pick overall, so it worked. Everyone, if you love Debbie, if you love the high school recruiting, you you knew Bijan Robinson was special. However, you take on a ton, a ton of risk when you draft the freshman running back. I mean, we all know, right? How many running backs get hurt between college and the pros and even at the pro level? So the the odds of a young gentleman at 18 making it to the NFL, even as a top-level prospect, is slim. But when you see a great high school recruit like B. John Robinson, you just take him across your fingers that he doesn't get hurt. So we have another young man right now, if you haven't seen him, you guys, you want to see something special this year. Nicholas Singleton of Penn State. He had 1,000 yards as a true freshman last year. He is a home run hitter. I think he had like five touchdowns over 50 yards. 
He's coming into his sophomore season. He's hit the Penn State weight room. If you guys know anything about prospects, I don't know what Penn State's doing in Happy Valley. If they're smoking something, they're drinking something, I don't know what they do. But, man, <laughs> the athletic prospects that they have coming out of Penn State from Mike Giusecki to Saquon Barkley and this young man, Nicholas Singleton, is the next real deal. But we still got two years of college football till he's in the NFL, and a lot can happen. But I happen to have him on some Debbie teams anyway. That makes sense. So um, as a Clemson fan, my condolences to people <laughs> draft day, DJ Uyungle. <laughs> Sounds like it um, might not have worked out for you if you took him at a specific time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, I so we talk- you say, you've said you're a Clemson fan before, yeah. <laughs> which has been wide receiver you until recently. Oh, my God. They had some good yeah. wide receivers through there. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about the difference between college and Debbie. What about Debbie and Dynasty? So dynasty, you only can draft the players when they are actually in the NFL. So dynasty players for the first time had the opportunity to draft Bijan Robinson this year. I've had Bijan for three years on a Debbie team. No one could have him. I drafted him when he was a freshman. I took the big risk. It was a big risk. Kept him on my roster that long, and I'm able to have him. So Debbie is a longer process where you're looking at young men early. And the one thing you have to be very careful with, I in general don't take freshmen. Bijan and Nicholas Singleton are outliers. I usually prefer sophomores. I want to see it one year at the college level, usually before they make it. But you're oh, what I love. So, Kendra Miller begins to pop last October. And then by about November, you're like, oh, my God, this, this guy is a legitimate NFL prospect. So you, some leagues have a developmental draft in November. You could have gotten Kendra Miller because I don't think anyone had. I mean, I guess if you were in a deep Debbie league with, like, you know, 20 players per roster – but what the ones that I play, I like to have a little turnover to make the league more interesting. Unlike Dynasty, here's another good difference. Dynasty, when you can go what? Some leagues are 40 deep and there's just nothing on the waiver wire. I like having a healthy Debbie waiver wire. So if you have five, four to seven players on the Debbie, there's always going to be people popping up. And then unfortunately, some players are going to get injured. So I don't have my, I don't have those deep Debbie rosters. My rosters tend to be a little bit smaller to give people more of a feeling of engagement. Because if you're in a Debbie or a dynasty league with like 40 man rosters, it's really hard to make any changes to your team to move it forward. You mentioned you're teaching here, so you got the summer off. Are you teaching high school by chance? Because that, that would seem to be a bit of an advantage here. Because when we're talking Debbie. You mentioned it. There's people getting drafted. Archie Manning's probably been drafted on some of Debbie roster <laughs> for three years now already since he's been in the seventh grade, right? There is literally Debbie, league, Debbie leagues out there right now that have kids. They're probably still in junior high, let alone high school. I'm sure Patrick Mahomes' kid has already been drafted to some kind of a Debbie league right now. So when you're looking at these prospects as early as high school or those guys coming in, and there's an incoming freshman here we'll talk about a little bit later. I don't want to give it away yet. Maybe yeah. a running back in the state of texas but well they got some running these, backs down there <laughs> they, they know they know how to raise them down in texas they do. now what are some of these strategies when you're looking at these high school prospects because this is like the ultimate dart throw right when you're looking at these kids i mean i remember up here in canada we have junior hockey and kids are getting drafted at 15 years of age to play in the junior league which yeah, is yeah. the whl the chl whatever it looks like so they're playing in the under 22 league getting drafted at 15 you haven't even grown facial hair yet. Well, <laughs> some of us already had facial hair at 15, but not everyone had facial hair at 15. I didn't. Lots can still happen by the time you turn 18. There's a lot of growth and this and that. So, again, when you look at these high school prospects, what are some of your strategies that you deploy here for your Debbie Leagues? First thing, we're, we're lucky as a hobby. If you don't know Rivals.com, ESPN Super 300, um, there's, I like 24 seven sports. I've been looking at their rankings. I don't know, 20 years now. I forgot when I started looking. So what I do is, and then you can find sites that have consensus rankings, right? So you can have a site that says 
Hey, he, um, B. John Robinson is what they would call a consensus five-star prospect. What that means is 24-7 sports, ESPN, and rivals all gave him five stars. So in general, when you have a five-star consensus player, I'm going to watch a little what I can get. It's hard. Believe me, try to get some high school tape with some – like it's not a 15-year-old shaking the camera on the sideline. I don't blame the young kid who's shaking, but it's hard. But I'm going to rely on those rankings. I'm going to rely on some highlights. So you know, if you look at statistically, the best barometer of future NFL success in general are five-star freshmen. Once you get to the four- and three-level star prospects, there's not a big difference between a three- and a four-star prospect if they're going to end up in the NFL. So those are the young men that I want to see sophomore year. So, like, I've seen Arch Manning the highlights. I mean, look, he's Arch Manning. You know what's right. So that it's an easier one. But you watch him, and you knew he has the basic skills of a high school quarterback. And all the – not like – I think he was consensus, but maybe someone had a metaphor. So, he, but if my memory serves me, so you, I just watched the the elite of the elite. Does that make sense? Like maybe the top twenty players at the high school level. But I'm going to rely on the rankings, and I'm much more. It's easier to get college film. It's easier to watch college games because basically all 133 teams are on the internet. You can see highlights everywhere. You can get game tape. So that's why when I mentioned I like the second year players is where the value is at, if that makes sense, because we've seen them perform. And I'm a little old, old curmudgeon. I've seen too many highly touted college or high school young men just not make it at the college level. Man. Speaking of that, I just want to touch base. Are we? Sh- I've seen pictures of Archie Manning working out. Are we sure he's a Manning? Like, Are we uh, really sure that he's a Manning? I mean, I'm all in the, all reports indicated, so I'm all gonna reports. go with it. But, <laughs> but I'll say this: it's interesting that he is more of his grandfather than he is his to his dad and his uncle, or his two uncles. I think he's Cooper's son. Sorry, I forget. Yeah. So yeah, he's Cooper's. But, but he is very athletic and runs, and he he's your modern day quarterback. Now I don't know if that's the function of where college slash NFL is headed with the more mobile quarterback. But if you've ever gone back, I'm an old man. And when sometimes when I have time, I'll just pop in YouTube, go watch some tape of Archie before new Orleans just destroyed his career. I mean, they were so bad, man. Was that young man athletic back in 1973, man. It just, the saints were so bad. So I do see more of this grandfather because Peyton and Eli were your pocket sit in there, take the big hit, throw the ball down the field. But Archie's different. Arch Manning is different than their his uncles. Yeah, so I've heard the, the term Debbie depleted in the past. What exactly does that mean? Um, how does how does that affect, like, the uh, players in a rookie draft? So there's a bunch of ways. Some – I. So one, let me say, I like to make the league more competitive. The one thing I've noticed now over Dynasty and Debbie, if you go too deep, orphan teams are going to pop up. If you're going like, you know, 30-man rosters, if you're buried, it is very hard. And, and I just see people quit. So what I like to do is I like to make the Debbie a little bit more interesting with capping the amount of players so i think what you're saying major debbie depleted right Mm -hmm. that means there are literally no one of interest available on the waiver wire so like in a in a debbie depleted league i would say last year kendra miller was on someone's roster last july but that you probably had to go you know 20 debbie players 12 team leagues so that would give you what 240 college players. So that's what Debbie depleted means. So how does that affect like the rookie draft though? Like, Cause you already oh. drafted them in, in the past. So like, how do you, how do you, do you have rookie drafts in Debbie leagues? So what I suggest and everyone's different, but what I suggest you can only promote two players 
from your Devi squad to your NFL squad. What that does is it replenishes the rookie draft. Now, you might not be super deep in the rookie. I mean, you're probably going to have, if the league's a good Devi league, you'll probably have your top 20 rookies off the board. But a Kendra Miller could have slipped through. Does, you know, that type of player, a Rasheed Rice yeah. would have slipped through. There's no way Dalton Kincaid was on anyone's Debbie roster. He wasn't even the starter at Utah when the <laughs> season opened. So right. he came in when the starter got hurt. So I like to be able to keep the rookie track. Cause I don't know if you're like me, you love the draft, right? Isn't that the fun thing? Rank the players draft. So right. you could have a Debbie draft in July. You could have a supplemental draft in, in November. You have a promotion right around January, maybe around the senior bowl. Everyone has to identify their two players they're promoting. If you have someone who's in the draft class, but they're not promoted, they go back into the rookie pool. Now, if you have, like I have Nicholas Singleton and B. John Robinson, I kept them on my team. They were just on the Debbie roster. But that, and then you draft your rookie draft if you want to do it. Well, after the NFL draft, right before the NFL draft, whenever you do it. So you're keeping people actively involved. I mean, what I've seen, people get, I mean, there's the dead time, right? I mean, we've all known that. Hey, I'm not in the playoffs. Um, it's December 1st. I, we can't make trades. I got to wait until my dynasty draft in April. Right. Oh my God. Well, let's do something that's a little bit more interesting in the middle of there. So in a good Debbie league, if you've timed it out, you could end up with like three drafts, spread them out throughout the year. And and don't, don't, cause like it, I, I'm not trying to be like, but if I play with 11 beginners, it's probably not very fair that I, I, I get into this Debbie draft and let's just say I get crazy lucky and I get, you know, four of the top 10 rookies in next year's draft. Well, you know, how interested is going to be the person with no one? You know, I'm trying. So if you limit it, it keeps other people involved. So real quick. So the, the, the players that you don't promote, they go back into the rookie draft? Yes, unless they're an underclassman. Okay. So, so let's say, let's just say Magic Wand. I had Bijan Robinson. I had Jordan Addison and I had Kendra Miller, which could have been, which is completely possible. Right. Well, I could only promote two of those. So let's say I promoted Kendra Miller and Jordan Addison. That means Devin A. Chain goes back into the, the draft pool. Now, yeah. if I, I, I have Nicholas Singleton, I can still keep him on my Debbie team. Because he's an underclassman. He's an underclassman. <laughs> Got yeah. it. Very interesting. Um, let's talk about Another campus strategy. to call it. Yeah, this is like we're getting it. We're getting it. We're soaking <laughs> it in. <It's> fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm wanting to join Lynn like literally right now. Um, let's talk about. <laughs> uh, Looking back, immediately thinking, okay, I'm going to start a dynasty Debbie. <laughs> oh, <Vipers. man>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what about campus to college leagues? So that's kind of a. a it's taking Debbie college football and NFL and rolling it into one. So <laughs> the I I have one campus college to campus, right? No, campus to campus to Canton League. What's fun about that is you have to know the deep pool. So my league, I think we have 54 players on the roster. But you're playing two games each week, Tara. One NFL game and one college game. So what that means is I have to set two lineups each week, my college lineup and my NFL lineup. So mm. I, what the first thing you have to do to me, you have to have parameters. So in my college to Canton league, campus to Canton, I have 20 NFL players and 25 college players. Now, if I, ha I didn't happen to have Bijan on that team, he would have made it from, I would have promoted him from my college team to my NFL roster. But I did have Jordan Addison. Now he ended up hurting me on the college side because he wasn't as good. He got hurt. 
But, he, you know, he was so good the year before Pittsburgh. So he gets promoted. Now, there are – I had Tajay Spears. I've, I've had Tajay Spears for the last two years on my teams. I loved him for college fantasy football. Now, my concern was I didn't know if he was over 200 pounds, which you ended up checking the box. I think he was 201 right there. That was important if you look at statistics. And if you're 199, I'm not going to, you know, within that margin of error, right, 198 to 202. And then the G5 is always a concern because they play in the American Athletic Conference. Once he got high draft capital for a G5 player, I'm all in. So he's promoted now. So I have hit, I had him and Jordan Addison who go up to my NFL team. But then there's guys, so that there's a player called DJ Irons, dual threat player at Akron. Great college player. He's not going to go pro. I, I, he's just not. When DJ Irons leaves, you have to cut unless he makes it the pro, but I don't. You would end up cutting him because he's a college player that isn't going into the NFL. And then you have a re, you have a draft again. And you, so I need again to get, let's say I got six players go into the NFL draft. They move up to my team. And then let's say four players graduate or they're not going to the NFL. Then I have to, in our supplemental draft, I need 11 more college players to put on my team. So there's two levels at the college. I want to draft players to help me win the college game. But I need players who are going to be promoted to my NFL squad. So, Tajay yeah. Spears was a better player last year than Devin A. Chain. <clears throat> now, I have Devin A. Chain ranked higher than Tajay Spears moving forward at the NFL level. But Tajay Spears, I think he had almost 2,000 yards from scrimmage and he had double-digit touchdowns. He was, he was in my sleeper column in college fantasy football. He was a fringe NFL prospect. Now, he was so good. We know where he is now with Tennessee. So you always have to balance. And that's why I mentioned G5 and Power 5. Power 5 are what we know. Clemson, Alabama, Texas A&M, USC. That's the Power 5. Mm -hmm. The G5, I'm a UConn fan. I have season tickets to UConn football, Tulane, Akron, their programs are really good athletes. We're just not stocked with Alabama athletes, Clemson athletes. So you have to know where the player is from, but there's really good players at that level who can win your college fantasy football league. This feels like Thanos right before the snap, trying to get yeah. everything perfectly balanced there with the, the finger and having it on there. When you're talking about this, that's probably one of the biggest challenges when you're looking at these college to captain type leagues because – you don't want to lose. No matter what league you're in, yeah. you don't want to lose. So you want the best players for your college team, but they're not necessarily the best players for your pro team later on down. So what are some more challenging aspects of running or participating in one of these Debbie-type leagues? It's definitely understanding you are looking for skills and traits that NFL scouts and NFL organizations want to be successful. So I'm trying to think, two years ago, the quarterbacks all fell in the draft, right? We didn't have, who was the who was the first one taken? Desmond Ritter, right? Was he the first one taken two years ago? I think he was, but that was like a second round draft pick, right? He went later than we thought. <clears throat> um, and then you had Malik Willis, who was from Liberty, which would be a G5 program. If you had watched Malik Willis, you knew he was incredibly athletic. And he was like a Debbie darling, but he fell to Tennessee in the third round, which crushed his um, fantasy football value at the NFL level. Now, Malik Willis is a college fantasy football player, was absolutely incredible from a college player. But the NFL did not like what they saw out of Malik Willis as far as a passer. I, I mean, I, that's I haven't talked to a scout, but obviously that was a concern. So you you need to know the difference between the Debbie CFF and draft prospects. So Desmond Ritter turned out to be 
the better NFL asset potential quarterback because he played at a, a, a higher level of competition and got to the um, playoffs against Alabama. Yeah. So, so we're so I'll go you, ahead. Okay, just real quick kind of on this subject. So are you noticing like maybe a change positionally? Because we see all these changes happening with running backs and the value and whatnot. And, you know, looking at some of these rookies that we have coming in, you know, we've got a lot of guys who had a ton of production, like oh, well over a thousand yards, over 200 carries, touchdowns, good yards per carry and all that stuff, played for a uh, power five team, but they're not getting drafted early, you know, um, thinking like a guy like Eric Gray, you know, are there a lot of these players that you have to be very careful of that are, you know, they've got all the statistics and it's not translating to draft capital. <laughs> so, Tara, you're going to hear my old man come out on me. Um, I grew up in the age of the Houston Cougars with Andre Ware and David Klingler. And literally just, I mean, the numbers that they put up in the late 80s, early 90s, I mean, I had never seen anything like that. 42 touchdown passes in 1988 is like, that was a dream. I had never seen anything like it. I think there's a game where Andre Ware had seven or eight touchdowns on you know, it was a Saturday night game in the old Houston Astrodome. I thought he was going to be an NFL star. Like, I thought he was the future of the league, right? I mean, come on, throwing for 450 yards and seven touchdowns. He looked like he had arm strength, right? Like, checked a lot of boxes. The Detroit Lions took him. But I learned a lot <laughs> from that whiff. And then David Klinger was even a bigger whiff when he ended up with the Cincinnati Bengals. And... What that whiff was, was schemes matter at the college level tremendously. That run and shoot, what Houston was doing, and same thing with BYU. If you go back to Steve Young, Jim McMahon, those, those guys yeah, with Lavelle Edwards at BYU, they were putting up silly numbers. So you had these coaches in the 70s and 80s who were just so far ahead of the country as far as the passing game. Right, They were just throwing the ball like crazy. But it didn't translate to the NFL level. I mean, then, then there was Mike Leach has taught me a ton too. Look at some of the guys Mike Leach had in the air raid. 45, 50 touchdowns, almost 6,000 yards throwing. None of them go on to NFL success. What happened though, and I saw it because I love college football, the difference was teams like Alabama – began to recruit that level of player. When you look at what Alabama did with Tua, what Alabama did with Jalen Hurts, and we'll talk oh, if you want why he left. That's a whole crazy another story, but you got to think about how good of a player Jalen Hurts was. And Alabama saw something. They brought him in. It didn't work out. But when the SEC began to take in that level of quarterback and they tweaked they got offensive minds tara from those other schools they began to say hey what if we take that ear raid offense and we put julio jones in it we put jalen waddle in it right like because they were doing it with with good athletes, obviously better than me but they weren't NFL-level athletes. What happened is the premier teams about 10 years ago said, let's bring in the premier athlete. We already got them, and let's let them go crazy. That's what Ohio State is doing. I mean, why is Ohio State so good right now? Not only do they have the scheme that every high school wide receiver wants to go into, they, the, the, they throw the ball all over the place. So if you're a 17-year-old kid and you are a four- or five-star ranked wide receiver, hello, <laughs> you're watching highlights of Ohio State. They're showing you, look, it, we're going to get you open in space. If you start, we're going to get you a number one draft pick. But that's what they were doing at BYU 30 years ago, Tara. <laughs> now they're doing it at Ohio State. The, at the power fight, yeah. Yeah. So the power, and what's that done? I think this is Tara's other question. That's now worked its way to the NFL. 
the NFL was very reluctant to embrace this new player. They didn't know what to do with these young. I, I think back, how much better would Michael Vick be now coming oh, yeah. into the league with the coaching and the system? And he had a good coach. Beamer was a good coach at Virginia Tech. But come on. He just had the superior athlete and let Vic go. Same thing happened. And what we saw a glimpse of it was when he was with Philadelphia with Andy Reid. I was about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Because, but by that time, Vic was older. Unfortunately, we know what happened to two years of his career. But what if Vic had had Andy Reid just like Patrick Mahomes? Right. And then yeah. we had Cam Newton. And I think it's very important to understand Tim Tebow and Cam Newton back to back. Both of them did things that had never been done. Their style of play in the SEC of Florida, what Tebow done, he won the Heisman his sophomore year. And then Cam coming to Auburn, winning the Heisman, winning the national championship was just unfreaking believable. Tebow did not make it. And I, I was down on Tebow. I didn't think he was accurate enough. It proved to be true. I wish he had succeeded. It just it didn't work out. But Cam Newton had a lot of detractors. He ended up with Carolina. Ron Rivera let him rip. And Rivera was right. And that really changed, I think. The NFL started to say, all right, we need to – draft these young men who are just extraordinary athletes, put up great numbers, but we can't just draft them. We have to bring people into the coaching staff right? who's going to implement aspects of these offenses. And remember we had Nick Foles with the RPOs of Philadelphia, and we all thought that was genius. I'm like, geez, that's been the college level for like 12, 15, 20 years. Yeah. But they weren't doing it at the NFL level. The NFL didn't know how to do it. Nick Foles was above. He was, you know, I mean, seriously, I'm just being honest. He's an average quarterback at best. He won a Super Bowl. Now so, you put Jalen Hurts in it, and we have Jalen Hurts. Yeah, so I so, have seen massive changes. Go ahead, Major. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. So, like, we all know, like, in Dynasty, we're all, like, Dynasty gurus around here. We know <laughs> when to we know when to move off of a player in Dynasty, right? Oh, How yeah. do you know when to move off of a player or a college uh, prospect? If they haven't showed you much at the end of your sophomore year. Sophomore year, okay. You, If it's a five-star <laughs> prospect. And they've not done anything for you. You need to get off. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now. The great ones pop almost immediately. Now, there always will be a Kendra Miller. That's always going to happen. Um, someone's behind someone else on the bench. Or, you know, look at Jalen Hurts. Alabama let him go. He, he was unbelievable, Oklahoma. I was one of the, I have him on three dynasty teams. I love Jay. He was following me in the third round. And, Tara, that goes back to your previous question. <clears throat> I still don't understand how people did not like Jalen Hurts. That's a whole other story for another day. How he could fall. And then dynasty people. Now, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to go off on a rant. The <laughs> fact that people are changing their narrative, my friends, I went on tons of shows and talked up Jalen Hurts. I had great people I respect. No, I'll never use a name. They told me Jalen Hurts could not play in the NFL. My friends, go back. There were people who thought the Eagles should draft another quarterback yep. in 2021. <laughs> there were people who thought the Eagles should get off of Jalen Hurts. So this whole kind of new narrative, <laughs> please. Most of you didn't even know who he was. I had Jalen Hurts on my team. <laughs> That the year you're talking about, and I traded him because all the talk in the preseason was like they're going to get someone else. There, he's like the coaches don't like him. It was all this like detractor talk, and I ended up trading him, and now he's like the man. So I was like, mm, sucks. Yeah, the, the uh, what do I want to say? The retelling of the original narrative drives right. me absolutely bonkers. Right. Hey, I've been wrong on people. I was wrong on Josh Allen. I'll admit it. 
don't come on. And I can, <laughs> I'm never going to say names. I can literally tell you names of people who have, I have now heard them literally say the exact opposite on Jalen Hurts and Lamar Jackson. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole different story for another day. But Hurts ended up with the right coach, with the right system, and he obviously has people around him. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm into Justin Fields. I just I drafted Justin Fields in our um, Independence Day League. Man, people, it's about projections. If you <laughs> live in the past, you're not going to succeed. The, yeah, the right. Bears are better. <laughs> They they they've gotten better, and they say he played two years. He didn't play two years. I think he's only been on the field for like twelve or thirteen games. Last right. I looked, the yep. whole year was seventeen games. I don't judge a quarterback, and this is just old man talk. Till he had twenty games at the NFL level, I got to see a whole season, and then to see if he comes back to do more. Hmm. I love that Jalen Hurts shot out there. I remember it was about November of 2021. I literally took to Twitter, posted a video, said, Eagles fans, relax. Your quarterback of the present and the future is already there. Yes. I mean, and I, I my best friend's an Eagles fan, and he gets caught up in the Eagle hype, and anyone knows Eagle fans are unique. Um, I live in the Cowboys. <laughs> uh, yes, I live in the Northeast, so um, I hear about a lot of Eagles fans around me. But, man, the, the conversation around Jalen Hurts is just stone-cold crazy. First of all, I'm like, do you even understand basic economics? He's on a rookie contract, period. Nothing else matters. You play the rookie quarterback until the contract expires, <laughs> unless he is so bad, right? Mm -hmm. They've got to be historically bad to bench the rookie quarterback. And Jalen Hurts was not historically bad, no matter what you say about him. He wasn't. I mean, just nonsense. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, transfer portal. Um, how has that uh, changed what you do within Debbie? It's massive. Um, so I'm a big believer. I think this is great for the young men. <clears throat> the one thing, um, we assume rational coaching. Now, that seems to be what we want to tell people. But if you've been on teams or organizations or you're on any business, you know there are people promoted and you know there are people who move ahead who do not deserve it. Coaches are no different. So you have an 18-year-old kid comes onto campus and he does something stupid, right? He tells the coach, screw you, I'm not doing it, right? Well, we know now that that kid is nailed to the bench. I'm a high school teacher. I have three teenagers. Young people make mistakes. Now, good coaches don't hold it against them. But <laughs> we've all had coaches and we know how they can get personal. So what happens is you could have a really good football player, <clears throat> for whatever reason, gets nailed to the bench. They're just in the wrong program. This idea that you were 17 years of age and you were supposed to know your NFL future and what coach wasn't a salesman and what coach was a real coach? <laughs> Come on. This is, if you look back and you really think about it, it's absurd. It's absurd <laughs> that we expected 17-year-old kids to know everything. And believe me, anyone who's been around college recruiting, it's about salesmanship. Salesmanship, salesmanship, salesmanship. Get the kid onto your campus, and then you have him. There's nothing you could do, right? Kid could go nowhere. So I love the transfer portal. So let's say you end up at Alabama. If you know Alabama recruiting, Saban's bringing in four and five star recruits all the time. So let's say you're a really good football player, and I'm going to give you a name, Jameson Williamson at Ohio State. Jamison Williamson could not get onto the field for the Buckeyes. Lots of different reasons. There's different rumors about what Brian Day had against him, what the coaching staff, why he didn't get on the field. That's a different story for a different day. But he couldn't get on the field. What did he do? He made a business decision. Tara, you would do it. I would do it. Matt would do it. Major would do it. Someone's going to double your opportunity, give you a chance to make triple your money. You're moving over. Right. That 
Basically, Alabama said to the young man, you come here, you'll play. Jamison Williams made a business decision to move from Ohio State to Alabama, first-round pick. Now, the gambling draft kings, that's a whole other story. But that is what the portal should be for. Where it's really important, Tara, when a player goes from the G5 to P5, Mm -hmm. that means that a P5 coach now believes that this young man has done enough at the lower level that he deserves a step up in competition. So there's a player called Devontae Walker, wide receiver. He played at Kent State. That's a G5. But I think, and I I don't have the numbers. He might be 6'1", 200 pounds. He's a big wide receiver. Well, Kent State, he probably wasn't going to get day one or two draft capital, Tara. He made a business decision. He's at North Carolina. If you don't know, North Carolina has a number two draft quarterback in Drake May in the country. Mm -hmm. And they lost Josh Downs. Devontae Walker now has an opportunity to step into that North Carolina offense with an NFL-level prospect at quarterback and prove to NFL draft scouts that he can compete at the higher level. That's what it's for. That's great. I'm all for it. Uh, uh, I don't know the odds of a Kent State kid getting drafted within the first three rounds at wide receiver, but Tara – it's less than my hands. I'm holding <laughs> up right now, everyone. Yeah. Like, so now he, now I happen to think he's going to be very good. You never know when you move up a level, but now the young man has an opportunity to better his future. And isn't that what this is supposed to be about? You know, That's bettering your future, getting a chance to do better with your life. Right. Hmm. I, I like that. The, the transfer portal is turning G5 kids into P5 kids, which automatically gives them a little bit of a boost when we're talking about Debbie Leagues. As long as Nick Saban's not coming over to your house and doing the electric slide at a, at a family dinner, you oh, should be fine. Matt, you just said something. Oh, you triggered it. I, do, I love Jameer Gibbs at Georgia Tech. I'm telling you right now, if he doesn't go to Alabama, he's not the number 12 running back in the, in the draft. Right. He's not. Yep. They're not taking a kid from Georgia Tech that level. They're not going to do it. Now, there would have been scouts and organizations who liked him. But by going from Georgia Tech to Alabama with Nick Saban, that was it. And then he was obviously very good. And we know that Gibbs was a highly recruited prospect, right? We know he's – you talk about these five stars, four stars. Yeah. Can you talk to us about how predictive that the star system is when you're looking at these Debbie prospects? You kind of touched on it there a little bit. But I think it was, I think our good friend Travis May actually wrote an article yes, on the predictability of the five star, four star when it comes to, I think five stars, like a 52% chance or whatever that looks like. So you mentioned this a little bit when you talk about Debbie, but can you just kind of talk to us a little bit more about the predictive analysis of the star system? So I was kind of, yeah. So I, I believe that no, you're about right, 52%. The odds of a young man who's a five star prospect getting to the NFL level and being successful with good draft capital is you need to target the five-star prospects. Now that's one of the reasons why Zach Evans is so confusing to people and why there are people who still love Zach Evans because he was the five-star prospect. And there's some Debbie people who will never drop a five-star no matter what happens. He break both ACLs. Doesn't get drafted, and I'm putting him on my team. I'm drafting him in a dynasty league. I'm so still rostering Josh team. Gordon here. Yes, yes, the Josh <laughs> Gordon effect. That's a good one. Um, there are people who just will not get off of that. Uh, but I go – so then I think the four-star prospect is above 40%, but I could be wrong with my number. Do you really want to target those four- and five-level prospects? And in general – we know they're going to elite programs. What made Jamar Gibbs interesting, he was a four-star, and he wasn't a consensus five. I, he was a four-slash-five if there was such a thing as four and a half. But he went to Georgia Tech, which is out, even though it's a power five, they're not a top 20 program. And that kind of made people pause, because I do believe he's from the state of Georgia, no, or Alabama. 
But why he didn't go to Georgia or Alabama originally kind of left people like, oh, why is he going to Georgia Tech, right? So some people get really lost. But, like, there's a kid right now, Carnell Tate, who's at Ohio State. I believe he's a five-star prospect. Boom, everyone wants him. He's a wide receiver, plays for the Buckeyes, right? He goes there. You Now, the three-level, Matt, I don't think there's any predictability on a three-level prospect. They could, you know, <clears throat> they could be great. They could be dropouts after two years. Like, once you get into that three-star, if it's not, I'll say this. If I'm, like, deep in a Debbie draft and I wanted a freshman who's a three-star, they better be at Ohio State or Alabama. Because here's why I'll tell you. They have wiggle room. If they don't make it, they can transfer to another school at a lower level and they can build up their career again. Kind of like what Jameson Williams did. So you can take at the real elite programs, you can take this three-star prospect. I'm not taking a three-star prospect at Stanford. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not taking a three-star prospect who shows up, trying to think bottom left, Virginia Tech right now. And they have a they have a couple interests in running backs, or I think three star prospects, but the odds of them getting to the NFL level are not. But Alabama's probably got a three star kid who's seventh on the depth chart right now. You know, like that's how deep Alabama is at running back. Well, you mentioned that the depth charts here, and I want to talk a little bit about rankings. We're not going to dive into the rankings and give our top five or this or that this week because you can head over to fan tracks there and check it out yourself because John drops all his rankings right there in his 2023 Debbie football 101 and player rankings there. That's at fantrax.com backslash 2023 Debbie football 101 and player rankings. There's a dash between every word out there. If you're trying to look it up now, when we take a look further into the whole thing, one thing that we are missing when it comes to Debbie rankings is there hasn't been, I'll be honest, there hasn't been very good sources for Debbie rankings. Uh, credit to the guys over at the Undroppables. I think they do a pretty good job there. Uh, Fantasy Pros was an area that you a lot of people go to for their rankings. And unfortunately, their Debbie rankings, John, we'll say it right off the get-go, it wasn't very good up to no. a couple weeks ago. I mean, there's players that weren't even prospects that you were able to select down from the drop menu. There was players that were going to be drafted number one that weren't even in the search engine there. So I remember trying to go into the Debbie rankings and trying to do mine, but there was nobody there. So a group of people there, including yourself and Travis and David and uh, Eric and Felix, I'm trying uh, Michael Valeri there, Shane Hollum, uh, Jacob Don, myself, kind of went in there and got – working with the guys at Fantasy Pros to get the right names in the system. There's still a few that are not there. It's going to get missed. That's kind of what happens when you have a huge uh, directory of players you're working with. But I think they've done a really good job here of getting a decent consensus together when you look at these rankings. And there's a little bit of fluctuation back and forth. But you talk about this. We're not all going to see prospects eye to eye, especially when we're looking at Debbie. We're talking about kids that are going into their first year of college that we're already ranking guys that aren't even available to be drafted until 2026. So I think it was very important. And I, you can, I'll let you talk to this a little bit of uh, finding one area in which you can go to for your Debbie rankings and having a pretty good consensus of what that looks like heading into your drafts. Yeah. So it started with Felix Sharp and posted a tweet in which he's like, you know, like, what's wrong with the Debbie rankings at Fantasy Pros? And I saw, and I I, I like Felix a ton. We're, we're friends offline, and we talk and chat all the time. And I met him in Canton um, the last two years. <clears throat> so I immediately went to De Fantasy Pros, and I'm like, I, I, I'm i just like, I, I didn't even know who some of the players were. And I think I'm pretty hip on who the, I'm like, oh, my God. So Felix and I chat. I said, why don't we offer up? So we got in contact with a few guys and we invited like Matt. And I think there's nine of um, my old teammate, Eric Froton at NBC Sports. And Travis, you just mentioned him. We invited nine people to participate in Shane Hallam to put up their Debbie rankings. Because if we want to promote this hobby, people need pretty a baseline to go to, right? They need a place to start. Now, if you really want to get deep into Debbie, you can go to my site with Rookie Big Board. You can go see Matt. He has his rankings. He was telling me he posted them. 
they're deeper, they're different. Go do your homework. But if you need a springboard, this is a great place. And that's what we were trying to do as an industry was to put up Debbie rankings. So I'm going to tell her, I know Tara's going to like this one. She's a Clem- you're a Clemson grad, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you know a player named Antonio Williams, a wide receiver, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I saw a tweet earlier today. Someone tweeted out, why is Antonio Williams ranked so high in the Debbie community? Legitimate question. (laughs) And I love the film. Now, I understand he was a true freshman. People, you cannot look at Justin Jefferson and expect an 18-year-old kid to run Justin Jefferson route, please, <laughs> right? you got to understand he's 18. He's playing against men in the ACC. And, Tara, I'm going to be kind. That was an archaic passing game they had last year for Clemson. You saw it. It wasn't very good. <laughs> I don't it. disagree. Oh, you would never <laughs> get no, Oh, no, no, no. Major, that is not true. Um, I believe my Twitter timeline might say otherwise if you <laughs> from last So you've got to put it into context. I'm watching Antonio Williams in a below average passing game, but he's playing at the highest level of competition. He's physical, he's big, and he's competitive at a very early age. Is he an Uber separator? No. Did he get better as the year got on? Yes. Also, it's sometimes good to be old. They said the same. They laughed at me when I had Drake London in the summer of 2020 as my number three Debbie wide receiver. Can't separate. Can't separate. Can't separate. Oh, he just went number eight in the draft. Told you he was good. Watch the film. You can win. We all want Garrett Wilson. Hey, the guy's 20 yards open at Ohio State. He's open with the Jets at the NFL. Like, he's got eight yards of separation at the NFL level. That's insanity. Yeah. But guess what? Not everyone's Garrett Wilson. Right. Winning. DeAndre Hopkins has not had a lot of separation his entire career. All I know, he's got maybe the best hands of all time. Throw the ball up and the young man's going to get it. So there's a lot of different ways. But Antonio Williams, get a model. My model's on fan tracks. Six feet, 180. Early breakout age, four star prospect, 56 receptions, 604 yards as an 18 year old. Bing, 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 bing. The, the bells are going off. Is he perfect yet? No. But he's got two years to develop before he enters the NFL draft. Are all the skills there and refined? No. But is there a base level of comp? competitive nature and traits oh my god yes like like, watch him he's a really good player now anything could happen he could get hurt unfortunately maybe Cade Klubnik falls apart but I believe in Cade Klubnik I think he's a pretty good player there's a lot to happen but Antonio Williams is a legitimate NFL prospect. But if you don't believe, I wanted to say, but I, I don't try to get snarky on Twitter. I just, it doesn't work. I want to say, that's go draft Twitter, That's what Twitter's like, cool. What's the big deal? Go draft someone else. <laughs> Prove me wrong. I'm okay with that. Like, you draft who you believe in and uh, however you measure. But to say he doesn't separate as the only thing you're looking for isn't putting a player in the right context. Yeah, so there's a lot of, like, freshmen coming in. You know, football is now a year-round sport. It's especially, like, when I played, I played football, ran track, base. I did everything. These kids are focused on one sport. So they're coming in a lot better than a lot of uh, a lot of the running backs and stuff in the past. So who are some of the best running backs coming in, uh, you know, coming in? I, what do you call them, ascending uh freshman or something i don't know how they uh, um, yeah let's say a rising freshman i oh, guess there you go a rising and but is it is it Sec, uh, cedric Bax, uh, baxter and uh, everyone else or or well, maybe you let other the names out, you can throw in there you let the cat out of the bag but matt alluded to it i would have he said texas so i'm assuming yeah. that cedric baxter 
Now, in my model and what I'm looking for, I don't think Cedric Baxter, he's not B. John Robinson, and he's not Nichols, Nicholas Singleton as a high school prospect. That has nothing to do with the NFL right now. He might be a better NFL prospect in three years than either of them. But I I, I don't think he's like – I look, at anyone who knew B. John Robinson, you knew three years ago. You're like, oh, my God, this young man, he's just ridiculous. If you saw Nicholas Singleton, you said the same thing last year. I like he's my number one ranked running back, Cedric Benson. He's 6'1, 215. I mean, he's 17 he's years old packing on uh, 215, and there ain't an ounce that isn't muscle. Right? And he's got speed. Now, it's very hard. So I heard Shane Hallam talk about this one time. I think it was Shane Hallam. Like, it's really hard to judge high school speed on film. Because they're going against defensive backs who won't even sniff Division three level of football competition, right? So when you get this young man and he's just blowing, you're like, oh, my God, there's no one even in the tape right now. It, it's hard to get a – you kind of need one of those official – the thing that I like, and I think the stats are overwhelming, if you got a track and field high school player – their odds, and I, I heard this on a podcast about four years ago. It was by a scout, and he did the correlation between NFL draft picks and track and field high school athletes. And if you are an uber high school track and field athlete, but you play top-level football in college, you are good. Like, the numbers are overwhelming. So if you read my draft profiles, I always talk about the high school track and field kids. Because what that shows, explosion, burst, athleticism. If you're doing the high jump, the triple jump, do you know how much leg power? Tara's looking, she's shaking her head, right? Like, I don't think people, like, I love track at the Olympic level. I'm not watching on a Saturday, but when... When it was Olympics, I used to love the decathlon, the track and field. The triple jump, I think, is one of the hardest things I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. Like, you have to have such incredible athleticism. Or you get a 200-meter sprinter. Mm -hmm. Anyone try to do a hurdle? I mean, a, a high hurdle, like a 200-meter high hurdle? Man, I have a couple of my students in high school who do a high hurdle. I saw him. I'm like, oh, my God, if I did that, I might be in the hospital for a month. I don't think I can make it over <laughs> one high hurdle. I mean, that is athleticism. So when you see that, those kids correlate very well. I think that's more important to me than high school tape of someone separating. Because you can't tell. that. I don't know who the defensive back at West Texas is. Some kid, you know, I mean, he might not even play in college. So – you look for I look for the track athletes, especially at wide receiver. And if you know let this, me, uh, let, let me give you one at, yeah. at running back because, like, my one of my best friends growing up, his son is a track star out here in Cali, won all the, the championships and all that stuff. He's going to Utah. His name is Bijan Stanley. Okay, the dude is that he's he's for real, man. Check him out. Uh, I definitely will, my friend, because uh, Utah, I think they have a senior right now who's playing yeah. running back. So right. if he's the real deal, he might be on the field next year. I'll check him out. Thank you. Exactly. Mm, speaking of prospects, uh, how about give us one prospect that is about to fly up the rankings in 2023. Oh, okay. I, I think if you've listened to me, I'm way above consensus on that. And Matt can probably look at the fantasy pros to do it. It's KJ Jefferson at Arkansas. I do not know what people are not watching. Sometimes I just question – Man, first of all, plug him in the model, everyone. 6'3", 245-pound quarterback. He might be as athletic as Richardson. He might be. We don't have – we'll find out at the combine next year. But, man, you watch the tape of K.J. Jefferson, a quarterback for Arkansas, he's unbelievable. Now, they play that kind of RPO, slow mesh – kind of system so you're not going to get a lot of pure drop back he's you know no eli manning stuff five step drop and throw but i don't want those guys anymore but then you plug them in the model 
He was a four-star prospect. He's playing in the SEC. He's thrown for 5,800 yards. Here's the key. 1,400 yards rushing, 67 career touchdowns. His touchdown interception ratio is above three to one. He's smart with the football. He's physical with the football. He's played at the highest level of competition. He reminds me very much of Dak Prescott, who I was very high on. I, if you remember Christian Hackenberg, and I'm not trying to be rude, there, I had Christian Hackenberg out of the top 11. I didn't think the guy couldn't play at all. He was terrible. The only reason he ever flashed was he had Allen Robinson at Penn State. There were people at Christian Hackenberg as a top three quarterback. Christian Hackenberg went in the second round to the Jets. He never stepped on a field. Never stepped on a field. I had Dak Prescott number four that year in my rankings. I'm like, did you guys ever watch this young man? <laughs> like, it was silly how good he was at Mississippi State. And the thing I said is, wait a second. He And I'm not being rude, but Mississippi State is your second-level SEC. We know we got Alabama. We got, right, the Blue Bloods, Georgia. That's not Mississippi State. But he's playing LSU. He's playing Alabama. He's playing the Georgias. What did you not like about Dak Prescott at Mississippi State? There were people, I only shout him out because he makes millions, so it doesn't care what I think. Mel Kuyper had him like number nine. Mel Kuyper is always wrong. Well, I, I, I'm not going to go with it. But, but I'm like, how did you watch any tape of Dak Prescott? Any tape. I think KJ Jefferson's like the, Dak Prescott and Anthony Richardson. A little Tim Tebow. I don't think he's as accurate. But, you know, Anthony Richardson wasn't accurate either, so that's a whole different story. But I think KJ Jefferson, and here's what's going to happen, I think. His schedule is so easy in the beginning. And the coaching staff wants a Heisman caliber guy. He's going to catch a rhythm. He's Dude, he might have, after four weeks, he might have like 12 touchdown passes and five rushing touchdowns. And that's what the coach wants. Because the coach needs to bring in the next K.J. Jefferson. Well, how do you do it? You get him on national television. You get everyone talking about K.J. Jefferson. So there is a little bit of a gamesmanship at the college level, especially in these early games where the competition is much lower. So, you, I mean, Arkansas should pop out 4-0, 5-0, and and then they get into the meat of their SEC schedule, which is going to determine everything. But that's the one guy who I'm way above. He's my number four quarterback prospect, Tara, in Debbie. I think he's going to smash him. The one thing I love about him, and Matt was – talking to me about a Debbie um, draft, you don't have to draft him early. Man, he's a second or third round pick. He's an SEC quarterback at 6'3", 245. Please, please, what are you looking at? You're going to take some kid at some other level of comp. I mean, he's played against, he's gone into Georgia. He's gone into Alabama. He's gone into LSU. He's played this game against Mississippi. Is or I mean, or any, in Mississippi, Mississippi State, Florida. Kid is the real deal. I like you mentioned that high school speed. I remember Chuba Hubbard <laughs> up here. I remember Chuba Hubbard in Canada oh playing in Alberta I and with the big like fields. <laughs> Was he a track star in Canada too? Right? He was a track star. I mean, you put him on a track star as good as Chuba Hubbard was against a bunch of redneck Canadians up in where my part is on the big fields. It, it wasn't even fair. It, it, no. it was not even fair. Now, <laughs> speaking of not fair, the Kings Classic is coming up. One of the biggest college football drafts. We got the Kings Classic in Canton, Ohio. We got the Kings Classic College in Canton, Ohio. We yeah. got all kinds of drafts going down at the Fantasy Football Expo here. Have to give a shout out to Bob Lunks. We have to talk about him on every show heading into, uh, obviously, August 11th to the 15th there, I believe, or 12th to the 15th, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, it's uh, 12, we're the Saturday morning of the Expo. Yeah, I got my I got my Double Tree ho Hotel book there just for the Double Tree cookies. That, that's basically the only reason I, I got to go there is get those Double Tree cookies. The ones that are nice and warm. They got the little cookie place. warmer behind the front desk. Now, His mouth is like watering right now. Oh, I'm already thinking about. It. I'm already getting excited about that. You guys got a pretty big name of list of players here coming in for this college uh, uh, Kings Classic, don't you? You got like the biggest names that you could even think about here. 
talk about that. And then we got, uh, you mentioned Eric, he's also got the FSGA uh, college draft going on there as well. So college football and drafting in college football, it's it's kind of starting to make that ascension, a KJ Jefferson type ascension here in, in the fantasy world. It's working, it's a little niche out there. It's still kind of in that, I, I don't want to compare it to IDP, but it has a very specific niche. It seems like it, it's starting to finally take off a little bit. When we go to the Stanton, how are these guys uh, that are going to be participating in this and how that's going to be promoted? So first, we had the idea. I was going to go up to Canton the year of COVID. We were going to do the Kings Classic College Fantasy Football, but then COVID hit. And we were just like, you know what? No one can drive up to Canton. I think it might have even been canceled that year. So we started in 2021. We went up the next summer. Now, I've known Bob Lung for a long time now, and I texted I sent a message to Bob Lung. I said, Bob, I would love to have a college fantasy football draft live at the Kings Classic. And Bob's like, that's an awesome idea. So it's 12 of us get together live. We broadcast it on the Rookie Big Board YouTube channel. We gather in one of the rooms at the Double Tree. I believe we were at the Double Tree Hilton Inn there. We broadcast it live in one of those rooms. Um, we have a belt. I go to Trophy Smack. The winner gets a belt. Justin Heisley won it two years ago, and Shane Hallam won it last year. So there's a, you can see a picture on my feed of Shane Hallam with this championship belt. I just ordered another championship belt for this year's um, Kings Classic. So it will be on that Saturday morning live. You can meet all of us. I'm there for the whole weekend with the family and everything. I'm probably in that double tree in, right? That's where the big expo is, right? Basic, I think so. No? Yeah. So uh, they, they actually outgrew the hotel. Oh, They're actually okay. taking the show to the football field now under the dome. Ooh. Oh, I hope he has this at the football field. I have to, I'll email Bob Lung. Because, um, yeah, we went to the, uh, my son and I, we ended up going to the Hall of Fame football field. We wanted. It was really cool, by the way. Love going there last year. Um, we went to the Hall of Fame the last two years. So we're live. You can see all of us. You can talk to us. Eric Froton's there. Shane Allen's there. A bunch of uh, Mike Bainbridge is there. Uh, basically, the some of the biggest CFF people will be there in um, Canton. And what it, the, the second great news this summer, it's really Eric. At NBC Sports, he went to the FSGA um, conference in February, and he talked with the director of the SGA, and why can't I remember his name right now, whoever the president is, and he said, why don't you have a college fantasy football draft? The guy's like, hey, we can do it. You just have to organize it. So on August 1st, I think it's a Tuesday, August 1st, FSGA is broadcasting for the first time ever on Better Sports Network Live a college fantasy football draft. I think there's 16 of us. Um, The one in Canton is 12-team league. Um, We play all 133 teams. Um, It's going to be live. I'm sure it's going to be on video and on audio. I know Eric's going to – I think I might be a co-host. I could be wrong. I know I'm going to come on. Eric's told me I got to be ready. But if we can get – I would say, Matt, your um, IDP analysis is pretty fair. You know, it's a niche market right now. But one of the reasons why I wanted to grow the Debbie and put the Debbie rankings up and why I came on with you, Debbie, Dynasty, College are all – there's an intersection of the three. And if we if everyone likes Dynasty but we can grow Debbie and College at the same time, then that's what my goal is, is to grow this hobby. I think the FSGA is going to be really big for our hobby to get some big people in there and to talk about it and broadcast it. Because we have been kind of a niche under the radar for about 10 years now. Yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, I think I played my first college football but probably seven years ago. And that was on fan tracks. I think it was fan tracks. There's not very many sites that can actually support a college football league out there, too. So well, Matt, right now things. there's only fan tracks. Yeah, that's that's what it's been for the most part. So that's that's probably the next part of getting Debbie is yes. finding another host, so to speak. 
But uh, speaking of hosts, you've been a fantastic uh, co-host on this week's show of the Dynasty Vipers Viper Cast. It has been a pleasure. Uh, make sure to catch John there over at the Rookie Big uh, Big Board there, over at Football Diehards, over at I mean just about everywhere. Fan tracks. Fan tracks. There's like five <laughs> or six things. You're you're like you're like the Terra of this whole thing. You're like <laughs> companies here. By the way, you're, you're you're one thing that Terra's not, or she's one thing that you're not. Sorry, she's verified when it comes to Twitter. So gotta, <laughs> don't call me out there, but I made my purchase. <laughs> So while you're getting your verified on, I'm jumping over to threads right now while we're at it just to kind of try and jump the market there a little bit. I'm one of the, one of the 2 million people that have already signed up for this new app out there. So, well, anyway, that's for another show, as uh, John would say, for the most part. The one thing that – two things to take away from this. Debbie is more than just a niche. It's something we're trying to push out there a little bit more, mm-hmm. and it definitely can fit in whatever league you want to get into, whether it's an IDP league, whether it's a dynasty league. You can even have a rookie draft with a Debbie draft right behind it and still have enough players left over when it's said done, depending on how that's done properly. So there is a way to fit Debbie into your life. And the other thing I learned about today is Garrett Wilson is the Kevin Bacon of fantasy football with seven yards of separation, no matter how you want to look at it. It's you know, unbelievable. <laughs> so with that all being said, this has been the Dynasty Vipers Viper cast for John, for Tara, for Major. I'm Matt Donnelly, and we will see you next week. Peace.